So one, just one last comment on the on the three D printer stuff. One way to do it is three D printer right now, immediate product. The other way that I think is a very robust business that's that completely rides our value proposition of construction, and that is, here's the different axes that can do a lot of different functionality. So here you've got three D printer as one application, uh, Cedar for aquaponics is another. Uh, here's a three inch universal axis version drilling one inch holes in steel and we show little elements of this so here we got scalable flat frames scalable axes interchangeable tool heads and with that you can say oh wow we're providing a construction set for tooling general automation for anybody there's this thing keeps popping up for example there's have you have you ever seen this construction set for CNC that pops up on ads like build your CNC machine in hours. Like, did you see that thing? I've probably seen something like that. Yeah. yeah, we're like that, but it's like we actually eat that up too because they're like, okay, they've got the standard one size thing. It doesn't feature the scalability. They might have probably the equivalent of our like three quarter inch axis in terms of strength, but we're talking about two inch and up to three inch where you're talking <laughs> industrial. Yeah. So to show that from the 3D printer, Here's your little pen plotter, this and that, and just show little blips. Okay, you can do this, you can do that. Yeah. And we're spanning the entire realm of, of CNC, including crazy, like, as many axes, axes altogether. So just to show the one axis, that's one product, and all kinds of mashups, mm -hmm. uh, just going to total craziness. And if we could capture that in a website, which gets your head around, like, wow, that is part of the system, that's a that's like a killer app that that turns it from the 3d printer to a, to a very scalable business like if we talk about you know creating a training program for people to build that but we'd have to like what i see that would take is um, pretty much spending the time to implement to do the simple examples of each like here's the two inch working axis um, single one on this fat frame show this show this this whole diversity so the website focuses on an ecosystem not not the one product oh and by the way we have this 3d printer for sale for 9.95 for the kit right here and, and we're coming up with other things so that would be the, now that would take a longer time and it would take like say week per instance like cam 3d prints two inch axis pieces or one inch axis pieces shows that part yeah shows the shows the eight millimeter on the one inch or shows the eight millimeter on the two inch for like multiple heads doing different things just just that kind of stuff but it would mean that we're investing a lot of time into the actual uh, builds like these simple builds that we would feature as just expand your imagination here that that's that's the proper marketing for this and then you create a video around that and, and everything else and that that would kill it yeah. now it takes time that would take like i would say from here like six months yeah. like one week per head or per instance okay here's this frame uh, and the last ones could be even the, the rebar truss based frames where you can still ride these kinds of axes. You can do crazy stuff like you're putting a router head or hydraulic motor with a saw blade, like CNC sawmill, like mm -hmm. that level, that, that just blows it out. Yeah. And that would be a longer investment, but it's worth it. What is CNC saw? So that means you put a big log on a, on a saw and it, it will cut it, it will just do the motion of doing the two by fours, whatever you're cutting out of it, yeah. one pass, returns, you don't have to, you're not the guy moving it, it's actually doing that for you. That's that's the most advanced version of what exists out there. And at which level, for example, you're talking about multiple hundred thousand dollar machines, like yeah. multi hundred thousand dollar level machines including the larger printers which are also multi hundred thousand dollar devices at that scale and that's where we uh we have a huge impact so you could mm -hmm. make two by fours with a 3d printer with a cnc with yeah, the universal yeah. access that's been scaled so, up right yes yeah. scaled up universal access you mount your working tool head as a saw okay. cutting saw mm -hmm. like we have, we have in a graveyard is that um mm -hmm. something we have already or is that something we could do mm -hmm. we could do okay. we could do okay. For example, the, the saw that's sitting back there, we, yeah, we do the rebar there. truss, put that on a thing, and that's one of your offering boots is, okay, now you can put this hydraulic saw on top of this lar much larger universal axis and show yeah. crazy stuff like that. So that's, that's where it really hits, hits impact in so terms of uh, interest you, from multiple rounds. If you rounds. put it in a word, in a, in a concept, what would that be, like that feature? That, that feature is modular scalability. Modular scalability, yeah. Modular scalability. Phrase. Modular scalability. Yeah. 
North America. Not I've seen, seen anywhere else in the world. Yeah. I mean, that, that is what we have. Yeah. Even the simple rubber, rubber 3D printer thing, that's an example of a scaled or our design of a head focusing on scaling rubber printing. We can knock all this kind of stuff out on a scalability modularity front. So anyway, that's that's a longer investment, but yeah. it's very yeah. worthwhile. Th those phrases are are um, great for people who already understand what a 3D printer is. But um, oh. you're yeah. you're not talking about Ken's project, though. You're talking about the the, the bigger yes and no right? because like that's gonna serve as marketing yeah. so that Ken can sell his 3D printers. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, um, right. Forward it's marketing. Forward. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of can start out small and say we've got these two offerings, and then have another thing that says, "Look what's coming down the pipeline." We've got yeah. these in active development, and then people's imagination can go wild. But right. it doesn't scare off the people who just want a really good 3D printer, yeah. or don't even know what any of this is, yeah. and like maybe can only handle so much of the future vision, and really just need to know, just need to be introduced to the idea of what. Yeah. The 3D, 3D printers exist, you yeah. know, and that, like, oh, they could replace a part in my broken tractor, and then maybe just a couple of examples that are the real key big ones to get people. And I think that an, first. an important aspect of it is giving content, valuable content in, in which the yeah. consumer can benefit from. Yeah. Very valuable and simple and expandable, so there's more details that you can click on and find out. But at first glance, it's very And I think like that's easy. the wiki is that precise. It's the giving all the information to the customer, oh, but we need to digest, make them digest it. Yeah, because even, even those of us here who are already have a context and are interested have trouble understanding the wiki, you know? Like yeah, but is, okay. But let's back up on a wiki. The wiki is just a display interface. Right. Someone can take, if you know basic wiki edit, you can create a wiki page that's looking good, like Wikipedia. I mean, do you like Wikipedia? Do you think that's confusing or I not just, really? Well, it isn't because it's organized. It's, 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 the, same, right? like, it's the same thing. It's the exact same right. thing, except yes. here. We're, we're, we're just brain dumping at this level. There's li very little time that's been spent on information architecture or actual communication. And also yeah. just... Outside of raw brain dumps. If you don't know the terms, in, in construction true. terms and technical terms, and you don't know where to look on the wiki, yeah. you know, that's, that's my issue. You need to be, for, for absolute newbies, you yes. need to be spoon-fed the information. But I feel yes. like the, the, the front page, the first page of the wiki is so intriguing. Well, yeah, it lists everything, but I don't know what any of that is when I first start. You know yeah. what I mean? So that's I mean, you can find it or us. Uh, the point. You, you, need, you need to just silo things. Like you're interested in 3D printers. Here's a 3D printer page. Yeah. With pretty much everything you need. If you want to branch off from there, go get it. But the, the wiki is good to do the run experiments like uh, copy, right? You have different copy editing with different yeah. messaging for different audiences and you can target the SEO campaign for each of these wiki pages specifically, right? So it's a great tool to do great copy editing because it's so easy to edit. Which is a fabulous tool for us. I think for we're us, talking, yeah. we're well, talking once, once before you got here, right. we were talking about how to present information to Yeah, I've heard, heard Yeah, and they were and they're saying direct the consumer to the wiki and I'm saying, eh, No, it could be because the consumer, I mean, yes, but based on the link, Remember, they click right. on the link. That link gets presented to them where, either on, uh, on, on a, a Google page. search or on an app. That's also they like it's just organized. They end up on a specific yeah. dedicated landing page. Is it? And those pages could be as full. Yeah, 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 uh, it's this guy who has got bu quite a bunch of information on there, okay. but I mean, it's focusing on pretty rather than open source tech. But right. people who are like, so maybe the only thing that needs to happen is, is then, you know, if you want to use the 3D printer, printer yeah, as so a landing page for people, uh, maybe just whatever is driving the business yeah, instead so of just free. tidy things up a bit. And we have the website. I would say on my side, because the wiki is so accessible, you do a well edited stuff on the wiki. Like this could be the 
outside of the sidebar and the top, I mean, this is all presentable. This is this is the same wiki except it's organized. So, for example, like this is what our wiki could look like and stuff like that. I mean, it does in some places. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, you can embed any HTML, CSS templates, so you can do whatever you want in the wiki. So it's um, we always keep having this debate on on this thing. But wiki is just a display interface. It can be made to look however you want it to. That's another collaborator from a long, long time ago. Um, yeah. So, but I think for now, the most compelling stuff is, yeah, I mean, that, that simple, the MVP right now website with product, just basics. We can start on the bigger thing, like already, like for example, at the universal access page, we already mean? have some of what I was talking about, here's the different implementations, what you can do. So here's this thing. So the good website is basically the universal CNC access page souped up and really pretty. So you start with that. You start with this. That's simple enough. You go to larger things. You go to vert vertical things. You go to one inch scale, where that's one inch and eight millimeter combined together. You go to two inch, which is the biggest we've prototyped but we did it at like this here. We we didn't really even build a complete axis, but that's that's the carriage pieces with two inch for two inch rods. So that's the machine we were building right there. That was the equivalent of the like that, you know, look at that. That's that's a serious machine. So so basically like even taking some of these pictures and showing oh wow, that's the still the same universal axis. It looks a little it's a little different, it's a little redesigned. Mm -hmm. But this is the two inch and now if you were to put on, say, like a hydraulic motor, like a one-inch drill or mill head on it, this would already be like, holy shit, this is, this is crazy. And it is, because we're using the same building blocks and just in different variations. S simple 3D prints, okay. simple design, etc. I'm still back on, is AdSiv you guys? No, no, that's a different, it's different. It's okay. a different wiki. Okay. It uses, the commonality is they use MediaWiki as well. We okay. use MediaWiki. Like Wikipedia uses MediaWiki. Okay. And from this seat, the glare of the window, like I cannot see anything on that. So I need to. That's often the case with a lot of oh. the places to sit. Oh look, I got a little brown in my head. It's great. <laughs> what? Never took it out. No, no, no. So let's see. Here. Yeah, I'll just done for you temporarily. Yeah. You want to sit by Christian. Yeah. But man, like, <laughs> to invest fully in like, well, Ken, I think, as you do the, I, I think thinking about that bigger side, maybe that's not you, maybe that's everyone around us here. Just focus on cranking out those printers, because look, look, take a look at the numbers. What is a hundred kits? That's thirty thousand a month. That's profit. We're talking three hundred bucks per kit because we sell them for six hundred. I mean that you can do a hundred relatively easy. I think if it's just the b very basics of part sets, I would say six per day is probably realistic. No, but that's not a profit. Kent's time doesn't cost zero. <laughs> That's not but profit, that's right. outside of material costs, right. outside of hard so costs. Margin. It's whatever he takes out of the 30K. Okay. So 50-50 yeah. so for OSC <laughs> I mean, is the thing. Per month, that's pretty good. That's pretty good revenue. So you could take 10K per month and still be living yeah. high, high dollar okay. life. <laughs> to get to the level, so, so say 10K would be a good thing, 10K level, that's 30 printers. That's like, that's a good business. That's it. 30, one a day. That's a part-time job for a dedicated person who's set up. That's like a quarter-time job. So this stuff works. It's, yeah. it's real. The numbers add up. Just need to do it. And the value for OSC would be, like, okay, here's Ken. He did it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now get trained to do this and we spread this all over. So now divide this into the Midwest, the East Coast, West Coast, Canada, yeah. Europe, and so um, can sell the open franchise. Kids, there was one discussion yesterday about um, doing quality checks, quality verification to make sure that uh, it's meeting the open source apology standards. Is that but that is, that's, that's certification. So Ken would get certified. We yeah. draw up 
a common, well understood. So we, we have a bunch of this work already, like uh, quality control. Um, for example, when we did the kits, because we, we tried to start a 3D printer thing like two years ago. Um, well, what we st kit, I think there's something like kit quality control. But we started looking into it. We didn't really get far. No, it's. Let me see. Um, let me go back to my log. Back like a couple of years. I know that um, Ken's project is going to tie into this one. Um, so I know that they're not separate. But for, for this conversation, it would help me if um, it was specified if we're talking about things that are like beyond Ken's scope because I my goal in being here is to figure out what the 3D printer does because I, I don't I came here for this the aquaponics and mm. the seed home so mm. I, I haven't even like learned much about the 3D okay. printer and I need to tell my church people about it who have even less knowledge and less so foundational interest. Why would in you them. buy a 3D printer? Just start there first principle. Right, and I know why, but I, okay, I'm why? needing to, hold on. <laughs> I am, what, I'm asking for something. Just please don't interrupt me anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I am asking for facts about like, like how the printing rubber goes. Um, like I, I, I'm, my goal in being here is to learn some specifics, mm -hmm. and um, if that's not the focus of the meeting, that's fine. I just want to put that out there that that's what I'm in interested in learning from you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, you learn that when we build the 3D printer, you see some of it in action and stuff like that. So you'll I, get by diffusion, and well, of course we can. I might not be talk here for that though. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out how to help Ken with the yeah. knowledge I have. Yeah. I'd like to be, but I definitely have to be gone for the first half of November for sure. In probably a week more than that. The three, yeah, the 3D printer build is on the 20th of this month, actually. Yeah, I have to... I'd have to really work to rearrange a few things. It's uh, not quite out of the question, so I'll, I'll try. It, that, that really would help me a lot, yeah, to be able to explain to people if I actually build one. So, for example, like if you talk about the three D printer, I mean we've got um, um, basic things like I mean here's some hardcore stuff like D three D print quality requirements. Okay, three sigma quality on brimless print start. If you know what that means, no idea. Right, we're getting that <laughs> like on my printer back. I'm getting that like one in a thousand. Like I've been printing for the last three months. I didn't have it single fail outside of when the filament ran out. Hold on, just uh, a second. Let me get to that same page. Like um, turbo fan for horizontal printing. Like that's crazy stuff. That's like if you have more more blowing power and you go slow enough you can actually print in midair. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean that's like on that thing like that little duct fan. It's it's a great space saver. I tried to do the same thing with just like a box fan and then I had to like funnel it down. It just didn't work very well. 100 millimeter meter per second, 60 shore rubber printing speed. I mean, this gets very technical, but this is like very soft rubber and you're printing fast as ever. Like, that's crazy. So these are all things you've done already? No. Okay. I mean, we. I think we've done one. Um, the first one? Yeah. Okay. I mean, these are all things we know this thing can do. Each one of them could be like month R&D. Yeah. Or a weak R and D. What's the next yeah. one? Bumper part harvester. With vertical print. Yeah. So bumper part harvester. So basically, you put a bumper on the head so that when you print something, you actually bump it off, and then it falls off the bed, so you can have a bin below that, and you're just collecting a hundred parts or so thousands of parts. Part. Yeah. Uh, and if you design it to be, a, I mean, if you design it to be the appropriate geometry where it has a weak connection to the bed, which we know we can pretty much perfect yeah. right now. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Uh, active bed cooling for rapid part release. Mm. I don't know how important that is, but um, mixing extruder print head for multiple material printing and material transition. I mean, that exists even in open source. We haven't done it. Four Sigma quality control and mass production printing with auto part harvest. I mean, 
so like one in ten thousand fails. Like you're doing a run and and you've got. Oh, that's how you determine the force. You know. It's about based each on, sigma is based about on ten. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, 3D printed part boxer app. App. Yeah. Adding packaging to prints for 3D space printing for production purposes. So you don't do just one layer, but like add little connections to the next layer so you can actually print multiple layers of prints in one print. This would save you a little bit of time. So for example, you can even print oh, the packaging oh. around that and you ship that at the USPS. <laughs> or you have like plates and then you just stack them. So you stack them four high and they join at certain points. Just like uh, yeah, perforated yeah. things that you just break all the perforation, you yeah. just snap it off. Have you already printed rubber? Yeah. Okay. Like for example, if we do the aquaponics, the biodigester, or like fittings, we can right now connect. Mm -hmm. If the fitting, like say the macerator pump does not fit your two inch PVC, we can put, print a little sleeve out of rubber to make a watertight connection. Mm -hmm. That's kind of stuff is cool. Is or make ball valves with like rubber, uh, rubber gaskets and then other plastic around that so you're actually making a functional ball valve that otherwise costs you like 20 bucks or something mm -hmm. and it's Have like a few cents in materials printed plastic from the recycling yet uh no we we printed we did we made filament so we did this for example this is what we did do we have a spool of filament that's the spool of filament we made cool. using this thing nice. that's ABS that's a plastic shredder no that's a plastic extruder plastic it extruder. melts the melts the plastic and it goes through plastic. through this uh, little nozzle and it makes the filament this is low-hanging fruit this is what we're doing next month um, with mul like actually getting this to work like this this is just experimental yeah it works great so people we're gonna upsize stuff. it. Okay, would, they would need that as well as the three D printer in order to to go with trash. Take plastic and do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they need a high temperature chamber because because okay. uh, even ABS, many many plastics, you can't print in a cool environment. You have to keep it enclosed so it doesn't warp and get bent out of shape before the print finishes. So that so kind of stuff is. Is the kit then all the things you need to actually make things out of the three D printer, like the three D scanner, the extruder, the shredder? Is that what yeah, the kit would, is? Would, all those machines? Well, the the Ken's thing would focus more on this is the X Y Z robotic axis with frames and heads of any size. Things like the shredders or filament makers would be ancillary equipment, not really directed to that universal CNC machine construction set. So the other, so the people, the customers would be responsible for obtaining the correct kind of filament and all of that. Yeah, so the filament is pretty universally available these days. Even 3D overseas? printing, yeah, I mean, oh. a lot of the stuff you buy is probably going to come from China. Okay, you how know. about a 3D skin? And then the design, <laughs> there, there are many designs online that other people in the 3D printing community have come up with, and it's only if you want to make something custom, or if you're in, into making jewelry or something. You have to learn tools, maybe like Blender or something like that, to actually make the model. I'm thinking, the yeah, I'm thinking about the people with the broken tractors in Africa because those are the, those are the places that my church contacts would probably want to buy a 3D printer for. Mm -hmm. okay. So they would need all those ancillary things, or yeah. they would need <clears> to know what to what else to buy to send along with their 3D printer to their counterparts over yeah. there. So. Um, Things like 3D scanners are going to get you so far because okay. you can only really get the um, the outside of things. If there's any inner detail work, it's hard to get that uh, high precision. Like even if you've got like good to know. a hole that doesn't go all the way through, the okay. scanner might be able to define that outer edge of the hole, but inside it may just go. Well, I think it's like this rounded off thing because that's as far as I can see in there. Oh. So really, with that's these tools, if you want to make some of this stuff, it's good to learn. Modeling. Modeling. Yeah, that's essential. You uh, learn how to use the calipers, <laughs> so you, you can sit there and but take measurements. There's also repositories of parts that other people have made. Yeah. yeah. Uh, extract the parts, I'm unsure, but uh, you can find accessories to like iPhones, whatever, like things around other products that are, are already made. 
Okay, so we would need like a baby food training list for people, because those are, you can't use the 3D printer without that knowledge, right. you know, so I, I can't, and I already have a context, the pastors <laughs> definitely couldn't, mm -hmm. and they couldn't explain it to their people, so I'm trying to figure out a way to, because baby food is nutritious, it's just easy to eat, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to figure out how to make that. Hey, we actually did a website two years ago uh, about workshops, so this was like this kind of deal. Upcoming events, 3D printer builds. These were our guys, Sarah and Alex. We were working on a 3D printer business, oh, and then cool. we couldn't. It was like three months immersion in the summer, and at the end of it, it was too short. They they basically like we didn't get it, get it up and running. It. That's what I'm saying. Like six months is like a good time. Yeah. So they basically went back into the other things, but professional development. Okay, cool. Uh, kits. Well, we have here's. Here's like a little, I mean, here's a comparison. D3D, I guess that was the yeah. pro for seven. I mean, yeah, this is all online. It's <laughs> microfactory.opensourceecology.org. So we compared it to MK3 and Jellybox, these other other deals. Um, take a look at that. One upgrade that we could do is these more advanced stepper dri little stepper drivers that they don't have that kind of, you see this small vibration, right? You see it? Um, I see it, like I see it when it, I, I can see it now, but I think you can get a little bit of higher quality when the steps are smaller and you don't get any of that very tiny vibration. In the, so that's trinamic stepper drivers. That's like almost plug and play easy. But we have to develop it because it's like you got to rewire the control just very, very slightly. You got to know what you're doing there. So we haven't done it um, and that's in just production. Driver, that's not a different motor. Right? No, just the little plug in things. You got to do some more settings, make sure your settings are right. So, you know, that's a shakedown that takes you a week of time or whatever. Shake it down for high performance. Uh, universal access. Is that the fact that you can add more accesses? This is the universal CNC axis. This is what it is. Okay. So that thing, okay. right there, yeah. or in derivatives of it. In any direction yeah. you'd like. Yeah. And we built up to, but like, look at the radically low part count, like 14 unique parts. Mm -hmm. That's even. What? I have no idea. Well, well. I think we're getting that, that down. Cool. Well, maybe. No, it's about that. It's, it's the craziest thing. The next, comp like, Lowe's bot has 1,490 parts in their BOM, we have 100. <laughs> That's how this, this thing is going to be lifetime design and it's going to, it has potential. I mean, I'm still saying that this is going to take over the world if enough people contribute to it. It's just bigger, faster, stronger kind of deal, just open source the design to make it simple, you know, replaceable. Like, like what Anthony said about design that you keep upgrading for life. That's that's the kind of idea. Yeah. So up to uh, this universal axis, one inch, and uh, two inch uh, for Hampus. We did two inch, but we didn't actually make the whole axis. We ran out of time as we were printing in that workshop. But that's like big two inch bushings. And then you have applications like D3D CNC torch table. That's using okay, the one inch. You know, uh, yeah. That's a big two inch. That those rods are that big. Yeah. So now you take a look at the D3D CNC torch table. That was a torch table prototype. Um, and then the latest one was was well, this is the the one we're working on right now. We we're revisiting. So that was the very very first one that made it into Make Magazine. And then 19.10 was this one where we still have that frame up there, and that's like all auto gas control and stuff for CNC cutting uh, CNC torch mm -hmm. so that's that's one inch universal axis that's larger stepper motors bigger fatter belts and stuff like that and oh, cool. 50 was, 50 pounds of force per axis it was like those are control valves yeah cool. gas control valves yeah. universal controller um, universal controller con controls that all and that is this thing did already yes yeah and uh, We'll do this to make to run the filament maker, and we'll do this to run the aquaponics. You can run all of this stuff. So, 
uh, is just a generic controller with an LCD screen and capability to run stepper motors or or power larger power devices through transistor devices like this relay here. Can you do like transistors and relays? Through it too? Sure. Yeah. If you would have a like for other applications like a, a, a like you would have to well not out of the box you'd have to put another component in here to do that. Okay. But the cool thing is it's like, okay, it's an Arduino brain underneath it and an LCD screen so you could program it like you want. Yeah. It's just a generic idea. Okay. That's a power source. It's got a power source, yeah. This is the power. It's, it's the brain. Yeah. brain well, this is the brain here. These two parts are brain. This is power for the brain, and this is power for the devices you're running. Cool. Power okay. for the brain. I yeah. see. <laughs> That's power for the brain right there. Yes. Um, CB can right. run this. Yep. Uh, we have a dedicated CB controller, but but yeah, I, I want to just use this because then we can use one and mm -hmm. forget about it. You don't have to worry about custom parts and all that. So, um, but that's that's the idea. But let's return to the house because that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be uh, that's bigger than the 3D printer. Now the 3D printer is going to build those houses eventually, so we want to get the 3D printer. How, how do you actually print the, uh, the, the module? Uh, Vertical up, 8 foot, 4 by 4 by 8, big ass printer, which we're going to build not, not, not in three not weeks. Not vertically. Vertically? We're printing vertically. Why vertically? Don't you get better shear strength if you print it horizontally? Because you won't be shearing oh, all yeah. the layers? Oh yeah, yeah you do. Uh, that takes a four, so we can convert from going up. Uh, the mechanically, it's you can do that with one inch axis for a four by four by eight vertical. Okay. If you go eight horizontal, it la yeah. sags too much. Uh -huh. So you couldn't do it with one inch. You'd have to go to larger axis for that. Okay. So to go up is cheaper yeah. for the structure. Yeah. And uh, would it be plastic materials for the modules? Recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. cool. You could put okay. wood, like recycled wood, up to like 30% into that, so it actually looks like wood. Yeah. And it smells oh. like wood. Oh, cool. wood filaments. They got wood filaments. Put hemp in it, but if your ha house ever burns, all the people downhill are going to be stoned. <laughs> <laughs> Downwind, rather. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. It's a good line to add in for entertainment at any time. <laughs> yeah, I would cost a lot. Yeah. Pizza sold out everywhere. So, like these panels here, let's let's review what we we've, we've done yesterday. We cut up some stuff, cut up some lumber. So you can think of those two by fours. Think about that bed just you just popped up. You know, fifty of them. Think yeah. about a multiple print head printer, like ten heads, and ten heads times twenty like 20 pounds per day per head is 200 pounds per day. So you can get a production printer that is doable all with open source technology components that exist today. You don't have to innovate. Our extruder plus the super volcano nozzle kind of thing, the, the other heater blocks that are a little larger. Super volcano, they're 80 watt heater blocks uh, for each heater block for each nozzle. Uh, but yeah, think about printing up a bunch of these two by fours. And that is going to sell itself if you put that in a video on that website. And hopefully we can do exactly that in three weeks. So we should be thinking about that when we, when we do the workshop. We should be thinking, okay, how do we capture some good video for that, this website? And take some photo shoots and stuff like that. Like, uh, that. That would go to the bigger website of here's now industrial productivity on a small scale. So your goal, you want to print whole modules at one point, but you could also print... You could print the lumber, wood, too. Yeah, print, like, print the materials and build like sure. you did. Okay. Like if you have complicated plumbing, like under the, the, mass, the separating toilet, like all that, you can print as one piece. You don't have to worry about getting a bunch of fittings. Mm -hmm. You can all print that, including the ball valve in there. If you, if you have a rubber and regular plastic printer, multiple heads and stuff like that. So it's, it's all doable. What's the... Um, does anybody know the lifetime implications of that printed rubber? Does it break down faster? Or Thermoplastic urethane, that's, it's pretty, the rubber, okay. yeah. that's what they use for uh, snowmobile tracks, oh. bumpers, okay. other things. Um, it's not as common as 
as regular rubber plantation rubber, uh, but it's recyclable, so I think it might come in. It allows you to do airless tires, because you can print the airless geometry, yeah. which you cannot do using extrusion, the standard processes that you do. You cannot do enclosed pockets with standard procedures. This is, this is a great point of advantage. That's why I have rubber tires is one of the experimental prints that we have in this 3D printer uh, pr product development thing. That's a good low-hanging fruit, so uh, airless tire, take a look at that. That's oh, because you can make perfect. the tube inside of it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like yeah. little pockets, just do pockets. Or like the, you uh, have to figure uh, out the yeah. geometry. Like, like a Mars rover. Yeah, the, the rovers, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like look at these things, airless tires. It's like a round mattress. Um, let's see, like this one here. You know, you can do that kind of stuff. Or fill that, close that, so it's actually air-filled, so you're actually getting pressure. You can even inject, you know, put a little needle in there and then take it out so it's self-sealing. Yeah. Needle it and fill it with pressure, and you've got, like, air-filled tires that have both the, like, the rub rubberiness and pneumatics, the air pressure that keeps it s stiffer. So this kind of stuff is... That's a billion dollar industry right there, multiple billions um, for these kinds of things. Are there stats on the strength of the recycled and printed materials, like there's stats on the strength of recycled paper? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could track all that down. Okay. Is it, does it vary, like, based on the 3D printer itself? No, it's more more the material property. Whatever you're, you're okay. going to be printing with, you're just melting it to extrude it. Okay. So the properties remain what, whatever you have there. And the only disadvantage there is like, for example, for like ABS or other, maybe like PLA or whichever ones, but I've heard that you can only recycle like 5X, five times. You have to put in 20% new material every time because the properties get degrade over time. Okay. You don't get good properties anymore. That's kind of details. What are AB, uh, that's, that ABS kind of plastic. detail is what I need for the website, yeah. Um, ABS is plastic and PLA is another kind of plastic? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that the people are going to ask me. Yep. Yeah. So What's a, what, what do we know as the best, like, quick survey of 3D printing? Do we know that, what that is? Like a market survey? Or what do you no, mean? Like, a, like a survey course, 3D printing 101. Like, oh. if you Google 3D uh, printing 101. Who's got the best material? Because maybe we could just link to that and that's it. Yeah, that's true. Beginner's Guide to 3D Printing. It's firing now. I'm not sure if this will be allowed to get 91 in it, but... Have you ever heard of any issues with the gas up at Casey's? No. You shaved? Looking good. Thanks, Clean. Too clean. Yeah, so, uh, well, going back, let's go back to, keep going back to the house, so, um, let's see, uh, let's see the first, yeah, I guess we showed that, and then we moved the camera inside, so what do we learn from here, uh, so how do we do this, we did a chalk line across the, the wall, and then we put in the panels, um, any particular challenges to that? Uh, we also put a bar underneath to rest the panel on. Yep, that's um, a good thing, so you don't have to hold it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we realized it wasn't that straight as we thought it was, so we, so we made sure to use the straight section and then move that. What, the, the lumber that you used to yeah, support so it? Yeah, so when we put the second piece while the bar still rested underneath, we saw that it wouldn't match, uh, so we loosened that board and we got those straight uh, mm. in regards the board, to each other. The board wasn't straight. No. So. It was twice as long as, as one panel. So the first panel on the side of it came on straight, and the second one went loose in the board. But, but, the, but the, you can also do that with just tabs. Just have uh, smaller oh. instances of. of uh, oh yeah, shock line worked good. Mhm. Mm okay. And uh, I think we're still screwing this down with more screws to get this a little more tight. We filled in a section here in the middle. That was good. Let's see. Do we show that here? Yeah. And there's a slight issue with that, and you saw that in the last picture. Oh yeah, it's like the, oh yeah, so let's look at the, so Which here we filled it in, yeah, okay, here like on the edge it's a little off, right? Yeah, that right? stud mm -hmm. is yeah, yeah. four or five inches out wow. at the top. Three. Okay, 
which means which is w it won't be uh, according to spec unless we move those studs. But well, we can, we can um, fill, fill up the gap. Let's fill it with another so we don't have to. Yeah. Take a we don't necessarily have to do that right now. When we close the wall off, well, I guess we'll. Let's see, if we move that stud all together, can we just shift it over or no? There's nothing underneath it. I, I can't tell what's, what's in I there. Mean, if we shift one stud, then it will be very off in regards to its module. I don't know what that makes with the... how that changes the strength of it. But I find it a bit nervous to start uh, mucking them around. Yeah, yeah, so probably do a little infill. Um, so next on this... Do any people want to start laying up more panels? Because, uh, so the stairs, I mean, do we all want to kind of work on the stairs? And, and uh, it's kind of a bit of a bottleneck there. There's two saws, sliding miters that we can be measuring and cutting. The marking is going to be the, the bottleneck, I guess, at first. So yeah, and then maybe do a team on that, maybe another team on maybe more panels on the inside, interior panels. Yeah, or? I'm good at that. Yes. Let's um, do interior panels. And there's one aspect to the stairs, and there's a, there's a slight tapering going on along. Oh, okay, it. okay. So that means we have to yeah, <laughs> measure, good. yeah, measure yeah. as we go up. It's half an inch across those modules, or something like that. Half an and inch taper. More? I think it's three quarter inch. Yeah. Three quarter taper across. Yeah, it gets wider as you go up. <laughs> let's go to. Um, let's record that. So data collection here. Yeah, um, it's just a finishing, like a finish thing, because they rest on these, they rest on the, uh, on the they have a little gap to rest upon, but to make them flush, it's obviously less uh, So, like you'd say, seven, three quarters of an inch taper mm -hmm. across, well, going up, going up, you notice that right framing wall is about like three inches at the top, wider than uh, the bottom, or three inches uh, skewed mm. at the top. I wonder how that I did that. I think I used the level for that. Is it possible that the house shifted or something? Oh yeah, may, po the only thing I could see is. Uh, outside of not getting the measurement right is if we moved the, the joist then maybe we like shifted the whole thing but that's impossible because that thing was attached to the that so probably I, I didn't use a I didn't yeah. use a level or it looks something. like it got placed yeah too far in on the bottom and then yeah. made to match at the top oh yeah made it skew. yeah maybe just took measurements instead of actually doing it out of what's there already okay So we can definitely do more modules. So what else goes on here? These panels went on relatively easy. Uh, is it easy to hit the studs on 16 centers? Or is it? Yeah, when, once you, like the, the beat board has those lines. Yeah. So yeah. once you see on the bottom where it's at, it's really easy to just trace it, trace it up when the vertical lines on the beat board match the studs. <laughs> <coughs> okay. But yeah, it shouldn't be too hard. Now what I was I was just tacking down with a few. What is the what is the desired spacing for screws and how uniform do you want it? Because if it's yeah, uniform, I would say should, like we should yeah. pre-chalk them. I would say like every one foot. I mean, you just want this to not bubble up. Yeah. Um, edges definitely one foot, and uh, I would say like one foot everywhere, pretty much. It does provide some strength to the wall as well, so those screws add up in terms of. Providing a little bit of strength, and then we turned night here. Okay. So if we go to more panels, we do have to consider one one little thing, and that is where's the electrical in here. So let's talk just a little bit about electrical. So uh, let's. Let's do this. It's in a, if you go to my log, it's the wall modules design guide. The working doc in there talks about electrical. Uh,
So let's take a look at the utility channel. We talked about it a little bit before, but here you see what's going on is that whatever the electrical is inside the, the walls, like for example, if you've got a switch, we're actually building that in before we put the sheeting on. So the utility channel is where all the wires run so you can connect them from the, the electrical breaker box to individual wall panels. So the concept here being whatever you've got in a panel, all your wires, you just feed, keep feeding them through the bottom channel. The bottom channel is raised up through a one by at the bottom <coughs> so that you have this closing lip, you, you just close that off. The, the outlet boxes you see in the walls already, they're actually attached to the studs already. Uh, if we have anything in the wall like a switch, we want to do that prior to closing up with a wall panel. In order to meet code, however, um, you have to leave, there's a little trickery on the code because typically people, um, when an electrical inspection happens, you have to have everything exposed. Therefore, we cannot put the panels in yet, which means that we have to attach all the things like light, light outlets or just switches to the framing prior to closing up. Now, in order to facilitate cutting out those holes for the whatever the receptacles and switches and appliances you have, and we talked about this before, but um, you want to use the concept of old work boxes versus new work boxes. Old work boxes are ones that you actually snap into a finished surface. In other words, you don't have to be super precise on the cutout because that cutout has to be quite precise for a little receptacle. To avoid that precision requirement, so design for tolerancing, as we call it, you design it to avoid accuracy requirements because you're building that in, building in the accuracy by design. So one way to do that is if you have the panel, you know you can't have the outlet on a stud, but beyond that, anywhere between the stud is game. So for example, this light outlet here, cut out the three inch hole, or whatever that hole is with a hole saw, bam good you don't have to be left or right up and down you just decide it's there and then the old work box snaps in and screws in so the concept of old work boxes is uh, that you have this the way it works is you've got this tab see that tab so you insert this into the wall and when you screw in this screw that's tab pushes in and actually it, it's in order to get it into a smaller hole it, that tab is folded down upon screwing in that screw the tab pulls up and it folds up so it goes pulls in and it goes up and it locks in that's the concept there so you don't have to have the super precision okay there it is on a stud and you have to then be very careful about where you measure the panel very careful so that saves you a lot of time use the old work boxes which means that for the inspector we probably put in the work boxes there temporarily and then uh, cut out your panels, feed that wire, just all you need to do is feed that wire through that hole. So you attach the panel, feed that wire through the hole, and then you locate the box wherever it needs to go. Does that kind of make sense? Not really. Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, old work, let's see it, the videos on old work boxes. I mean, what's the, what's the code? For, um, is, it, is it 24 inches or 18 inches? Today I'm going to show you. There's, um, I forget what it is. There's a standard, it's, there's actually none because you can have them in floor too. Oh, right. It's, the, the standards are pretty much like convenience, but it depends on, people have, might have like a baseboard heater, so therefore you put it up, whatever. So there's not really a specific thing which says you have to be X height. Um, but take a look at this How guy, for example. How to install a plastic old work box in sheetrock. In sh I mean, so they do it in sheetrock, so whatever you're working boxes. in, you have to no make, a, make a cutout. Office, yeah, you have a piece of space that has sheetrock in it that you can't access to us. Okay? So, so what, what do you do? You install an old work box. So this demonstration, I'm just going to show you how to cut it in, how to measure it up so that you can get an idea on how to cut them in. Piece of sheetrock, we're going to have a whole so wall that's going to be covered. Wallboard saw or a keyhole saw. So they're talking as about well drywall. Now, we're we're using a, a circular saw, or a jig saw, or whatever. Or a that there's no studs here. Well, trace out. Well, so I'm going to show you. Start with the top. 
you do have the plate outside. around the box, so you can cover you some of the accuracy. But altogether, you want to be relatively accurate, um, just to keep your house tight. Now, so if you look at the box, you can see that these ears is what actually is stuck. You know, what sticks onto the sheetrock. All of this material here has to be cut out. So when I'm looking at the box, I'm going to actually make my mark to here and here in order to slide the box in. Now that I have my mark, you can see that I have an open spot. So what I like to do is I like to take my old work box and set it up flush against the wall on that line and make my mark. There's a tab there. Hey there, homeowners. Do you pay over $100 a month for electricity? If so, there now my mark is complete. Way right through here, and I hit a stud, a touch of paint, and it'll be good to go until I get all the way through. For us, hold it back. Reciprocate. And I slide it right in. So you slide it in just like that, and that screw. My outlet is set in place. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take these two screws and you're going to tighten them down. For this, we can be very easy with a drill. So for what we do is we'll stick the wires in the panel and we, when we put the panel we just stick, hang that wire out and then we can put the box in. And my box is locked in place. Now we're behind the wall. So look at now we can see our, our wings. wings. Yeah, those, see those tabs? Our wings are what actually holds the box to the wall. This is what the box looks like inside the wall. Not a lot of people get to see the way this actually goes together. It's important you understand that these wings are pressed tight against and your hole is not actually too big. If your hole's too big, your box will fall through and if that's the case, now you're going to have to patch sheetrock. Now, now in a typical fashion, you would have your wire hanging out already, and as you, know, you, slide you slide your wire up the box, up onto the wire, you slide your wire in, yeah, you, you slide your box in, in yeah. then you would tighten down your screws. A lot of times you can do this with a, uh, with a screwdriver, but I'm telling you, you're going to definitely want to do it with a drill. Just want to make sure your wings don't get flipped over, because what you'll end up doing is you'll run the screw through the plastic, you'll open up that plastic wing, and it won't ever hold tight to the You want to make sure... boxes, they don't go on studs. Yeah, like that one wasn't... That's not on a stud. Why is it called old? Because this is when you're retrofitting okay, so a house okay, so the hole, okay. Yeah. and you don't have access to studs otherwise you have to rip out a big hole right, 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 right. so old work is allowed by code in new construction the inspector looks for attachment to studs so we'll attach it to a stud and then take it out <laughs> I think mm -hmm. I think that's the proper procedure for whoever does old work boxes on new construction. There's nothing that says you can't use old work boxes in new construction. We haven't seen that. So um, you kind of have to hack it a little bit. It's, I don't think there's a big deal to this. This is just like a small detail of how this actually goes me mechanically, the mechanics of passing through the codes. But it's so, like you can't see through the wall the rest of the wire. So you're just assuming that it's they need to see. Wire. They need to see a wire. Uh, Without the drywall there, they need right. to see the box and the wire sticking out of it. No, just the end. They, they don't and the need wire. To see if maybe it's like uh, I don't know, connected badly in behind. The well, wall. they they can see all the connections because the studs are, the walls are all exposed, also, so they'll the see. see. There is no hole. This is just studs. Right. There is no there is no, no sheathing yet. Mm. So the the deal about electrical inspection that's done prior to all the interior sheathing. Oh, I. So like it's going to drill the hole, set up this with the, with the wires hanging out, and that's good enough for inspection. Well, when we in, the mechanics of how we, we go through inspection is we have no interior siding, mm -hmm. interior plywood on. Okay. We attach the boxes to a stud, like that one we just attached to the stud. When we're ready to put in the panel, we have a panel with the hole already. We put it up there. As we put it up, take off that box. Mm -hmm feed the wire through the hole and insert the box back in. That's what you would do. So we won't put out the sheeting today? Or? We can, okay. because a lot of the panels the do box. not have electrical, okay. and for many it's just running down the bottom, which is exposed oh, until the very end, yeah. until we close it up. How do you feed it from the bottom up? Do you drill a hole to the... You keep it down. Yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a good topic here. So the old work boxes is an important concept in design for tolerancing. 
because the tolerance is between the studs. That's your required tolerance. So it's easy. You can cut that out relatively easily. How about the wireless switches? You put it at the bottom. You could do that too. Stick some magnetic thing wherever you want around the house after everything's done. You could do magnetic switches. However, the wiring, like wireless, if they're if it's a wireless light, it's going to have to be either battery powered or wired. Mm -hmm. So you still have those wires. Th those get inspected. Yeah, yeah, but they'll just be in the down the utility channel. It's just so impractical to bend over and turn on the light. So you don't do that. You just put the wireless switch. Well, let, me, let me find one. Well, I think the same yeah, you can, goes. Uh, anyway. I mean, somewhere the, the device you're powering has to have a wire, you unless right. you're on batteries. Right, right. right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if the switch can just go in the utility channel, period. It's just there. So you can put. About putting it at, you know, eye level height. Yeah, that's actually decent. So, so okay. So let's hack this one. So new slide, or, or duplicate slide. So what would it look like with a wireless switch? Because we actually considered that for ease. Because we're trying to say, okay, how do we make it simple so the build is seamless? So slide, duplicate slide. Um, oh, so maybe there's some foot switches. You, you turn them on and off. <laughs> well, that's yeah. uh, the, the, the idea. <laughs> Wireless switch, because yeah, this is this is okay. You can do this. Now, where do you change the switch to fail? These types of switches, where it's simple availability and non-availability, really rarely fail. Right, that's one issue. And for fire codes, you would probably need to put that switch so it looks like it's a regular switch. Because say in an emergency where there's a fireman coming in, they need to have the lights, and that's required by code. So you'd have to mounted somewhere so you're kind of hacking the system but would it work at least mechanically like so say say you're putting it there on another panel it's not connected so that's your wireless switch which like Katarina showed the for example the pool pump mm -hmm. which is quite convenient and that's allowed by code because that's not a critical function for the fireman Switch, but lights are. Treat our firemen correctly. They should get to use hot tubs more often, like that. True. Then, excuse me, I'm here for the fire. Uh, where's the wireless switch? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wireless switch. So, say that's connected to this one, then you can get rid of that one actually, and can keep keep that wire running. But you still have to have that light there, right? So, yeah. say that's that's like your receiver. Um, this one down here, well, I'll say you have like a receiver, let's color them green. So that will have some wires going to it, and this is your, where you're shooting from. So you hit this wireless switch, it hits this receiver that's wired up, and it activates this light. Yeah, it's doable. What are you saving? You save the cut in a, in a thing, but you... You made this into a battery maintenance issue, so uh, and a fire hazard issue, like for fire people. Uh, if if say you move this from there and it's not accessible in an emergency or something like that, so those are some, those are some considerations. But yeah, if you just keep it there and you don't mind having batteries, you know, replacing a battery every year or something, it's doable. But I guess for long long term life, it's like you come back and it's dead and yeah, yeah wire it wire also, wiring would be also easy switches act as uh, components that transfer lines over distance as well so you know, and I, I might be crazy on this but I thought when a line comes into a bedroom it goes to the switch first and then, and then goes to the shot. light yeah it can be either way it could it be either you can have it switch terminated or light terminated right Okay. Okay. So yeah, you go either way. Okay. Hot side or low side switching? Yeah. Yeah, you can do either way. Yeah. You can. And you basically need that for a three-way switch. Right? Yeah. No, sort of. Uh, more but on a printer that, on a 3D printer, we do like we we um, high side switch because it's safer. Yep. Because yeah, that there's a safety issue because you want to turn off. Even though you don't have something on, you don't want a wire to be hot. 
So you typically want to switch on a hot wire, not on a low wire? Is that? I think that makes sense. Correct. Yeah, so something like that. I think it's more done when you're doing old work and you need to throw something in with existing wire. And I was going to ask is, how do they do the electrical inspections for existing modular house designs? Because you've shown us the ones where it's a whole wall of the building lifted in place by a crane. They oh yeah, they do it at the factory. No, it's at the factory. That's the thing. So the factory gets certified, and you're you're slipping through all the codes. Okay, so that's eventually what you would want to do with this. Right? Could do that. This is just this is interesting. <laughs> it's not ideal because you want to just slap these modules in place. You know, yeah. All you want to do is connect it in the baseboard, right? So yeah. So here, if we're preparing these modules, all the blue is already in a panel. Yep. All you're doing at that point is running the wire from the utility breaker box to connect to this junction box here. In this case we actually have receptacles above the utility channel. It makes it easier. In the utility channel we're just making connections. So the utility channel cover is just a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Very simple. You don't like put a box on it with wires attached to it if you're going to take that off. You put the actual receptacle, say it's a power outlet on the wall, put that above that so when you say you're servicing this or modifying it, like we, we do quite a, we do that at our house, uh, then you don't lift off the actual wired receptacles at the same time. It's just the cover. That's all. Do, do we so, have the electrical load on that? Like, how many circuits are we running? Yeah, yeah, we got that. So we'll, we'll get to that. It's in oh, here. Okay. So, yeah, so more detail. Um, you Like, for example, if you run one panel, so what's this one say? Electrical. build sequence one, two, three. So you install this panel with all the blue and all the wires inside. If you didn't, if you're like off code, off any coded areas, you can actually have that plywood already on. However, you have to watch it. It's hard in practice because there's a lap, lapping edge on the plywood. So this is very hard. But in principle, you can install this entire panel. Everything's already in there. All you do at the next step is run that wire, connect that to that junction box right there. That's it. And that panel is active with all the outlets. Cool. And then you close it and you can have you can attach other panels downstream if your wiring supports that. So here's like a side view. We do a one by two on top. Here's that blocking that you saw yesterday. That's the blocking we're talking about. That inside all the walls. Outlet would be like on top of that, above that, whatever else you got in the panel. Interior, exterior outlets, they could all be in there. And the junction box, it's it's within the wall panel itself. And then you got the bunch of wires running through it and that cavity there is like seven inches tall so you can fit, a, fit as many wires as you like. Uh, so there's a one by two and a one by four uh, there. And we have that sticking sticking down because there's the uh, sill plate there, um, so though not on interior anything. modules. Sometimes the green thing goes uh, the full width, how you draw holes through it. So the green, uh, I don't know what you call it. The, the blocking. Dots, the, the blocking? Yeah, sometimes it's the full width, I saw. Yeah, those are individual pieces because you can't break the studs into pieces. The verticals you can't break, you have to terminate at them, so you have multiple pieces. R right, but that one is the full width, so then how does the wire go through? Yeah, some blockings are uh, two by four. Come just around the back, right? Well, are you asking how the wires get to feed through without being... Yeah. Like you need to because they're actually in front. This is, the surface is here. They're actually in front of the surface. That's the whole point of this thing. The Does utility channel is like, think about it no, no, I'm not asking about as it. a... The, the wire that needs to go up, it can't because that green thing, instead of being half the way you do it, goes it's the full width. Oh, so no, 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 it's like this. It's like this. No. Yeah, go around it. Case. It's not what's happening it's everywhere. 
some modules have a thicker oh, two full by four. Width. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I think oh, one okay. of the. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You got to drill a hole through that. Wow. And you have Which to drill we stay away from. you put the panel, otherwise. Yeah, we designed this so you can eliminate all drilling of holes here oh. in that wall. That's that's your interior wall. Okay, you're actually right that you don't have a hole going. Unless you're on a second floor where you don't have the blocking, the blocking. No, yeah, you do. No, you're right. So, so there's yeah, there is an issue there. You have to drill that, but it's only like through one. As opposed to like typically, electricity is run by drilling holes through all the studs, like entire house. So that's know? cold still to do it. Which? Uh, to drill through a stud. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the industry standard. Okay. Yeah, it just makes things complicated. Yeah, it's just a lot of drilling. Yeah. Um, so. Then in the case of the and middle threading. wall. Both sides to have blocking, right? For the stairs, is there any switches in the stairs? Well, probably not on the inside, no. Well, actually, if you talk about that blocking, what we can do is if you do the double blocking, there's a hole in between, because that that would work. You have a half inch Perfect. gap. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think the ones to cover both sides were made with a two by four. Right. Because we realized we're gonna fasten panels on both sides, right. and, and right. Uh, Okay. So detail, okay, that kind of stuff comes out in the actual build. And then we trim it up with like little angle trim. Um, yeah, but... I know, so the lower side of the panel is gonna stick out more? Lower side? Yeah, well, so you have, uh, I'm talking about this hump. This is the end of the upper panel. This is the start of the second one. That is spaced out. Mm -hmm. Even yeah, though so we have uh, a hump. So this is an interior wall with wires on both sides yeah i'm just thinking for the staircase uh yeah in the staircase oh, like on an interior we actually don't have anything because we've got wires running into it into a light so actually we don't have the utility channel on the inside but we yeah. did need the blocking there so we can mount the plywood yeah because that's where it ended up so the width of the staircase is so uh, it's not going to have to be uh, adjusted for the inside of the in in interior um, yeah interior. no no, that would be pretty complicated there. Are we running a network? Like network cables? No. Or doing in wall speakers? <laughs> in wall speakers? No, not no, these things. I would. I would, I would have to catch that was what I'm saying. Let's see what happens. Two meters and uh, no Wi Fi. Just so like dead in the walls, no Wi Fi whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want those open source hackers coming here and trying to hack our stuff in this one. Yeah. I don't trust them at all. Too smart. Connect the computer and I'll hack you. God damn it, no! It's my worst dream. Um, All right. That's your worst dream? Well... Can you see this hard drive? Right? <laughs> so as far as the what walls have electrical in them, so that's kind of a, this is like a simple, simple layout here, but... Um, All right, so starting with the, that's the second floor, but starting with this first floor, that's what we have right now. So that's our wall that we're working on right now. And actually, that's two and a half panels there, so that sh should actually be two and a half. Are those green so, or, uh, Yeah, so, so the power meter, the actual utility box will be right there. You can actually mount it, um, but it will be... That's outside? the front. That's the front. Yeah, outside, inside the carport. So inside the carport here. So that's the carports here. Right, so if you go out uh, all these ways. Here we do have outlets on the panels, like on the front. So we keep that side open, but on the inside, there's really nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some switches over here, like, oh yeah, actually, uh, look at the detail there. But we still have the back back accessible, so we're okay. Yep. But yes, we do want to put a light switch for the, the stairway on the on there, but we can do that later, because the panel is all exposed right now. But we right can run now. it from the, the outside panel. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, from this panel, from yeah. from the back of it. So we're good there, and there's nothing back there, so we're good. We we ended up, so there's gonna be an outlet there, and then there's your your landing. So we'll put the wires under the landing, and then go into the utility channel because uh, there's space there. The landing goes all the way to the edge. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then, but if we go into panels like this, yeah, that has the outlet. So if we do put the panel on there, yeah, let's cut out, let's cut out a little little box. And let's keep it all at standard heights, like uh, like uh, three inches above the edge or something like that. We have that little bit of, um, we have that ba blocking it towards the back, so like, which is one and a half or up to three. 
So I probably want to keep it uh, from the bottom edge of the, the interior siding, probably put it up like three inches or so that will be about 15 inches from the ground for the power outlets. Uh, so we run, run wires. So yeah, some of these have outlets. Say we start in that corner, like that would be a convenient corner to, well, there's windows in here. So we do have to cut out around the windows. That's, that's the tricky part. You have to, you do have to measure for the windows because you can't just pop them in later. They're already there. Um, but we, ha we do have trim. I mean, we're going to use one by two or one by four trim. So you can be off a little bit at least, you know, like half inch. It'll be fine because you'll trim it all up. But we have to cut out here. So if another team wanted to do the, the panels, well, this one has it, this one has it. So yeah, we'd have to pretty much cut out a little square for the box and then continue there. So, so the paneling, I think this, this is where kind of like all this efficiency has to come in. We gotta really learn it and uh, we haven't really done a lot of this in this way. So I think right now it'll be kind of slow, but we can get a team up there, cut out the outlet box and then do the first panel, you know, start with that and then move on to the next one where, in, where one of these two panels, you also want to have another 15 If you're using outlet. oscillating or roto zip, it's going to be easier to do it while the wall is mounted. But if you have a problem with um, electrical lines... You can't really with mounted because you've got insulation back there already and stuff, so you'll be hitting things. I mean, what... You'll be cutting the insulation, so you want to pre-cut it, um, right? I mean... I mean, oscillating tool is a, very, a precision tool. Roto zip is also a precision tool that is supposed to be measured based on the edge that you're cutting. I mean, you're right, you probably would um, hit it a little bit, but they, they're... I mean, you could actually... When we're doing this, when we're doing this in, like, space, it, when you're doing it in space with it, I, I guess I would just say, like, every one of them be dry fit and, and mark before they're, like, just put on the thing and mark because uh, yeah. the, the ballasts underneath are at different heights as well as um you know you you could actually put in the whole panel and uh kind of mark it just about right but just drill little holes and you can see through the other side of the window you can just take a circular saw with a you know get your blade that right away and just cut it out in place too i think that would be actually you know, i'll bring the oscillating saw over there i mean that that the right tool can make this very 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 simple are you talking about a reciprocating saw? That is slow is as anything. Is it oscillating? No, yeah, that's that's like for little details. That that's gonna take all day to cut that. That that's when you do like little cuts. That's very slow. So you, I would just take. Some bad bits. No. Like I'm pull up your new jig or. I don't know, we could probably, I mean, what makes the most sense? Okay. Try and see if we can. Try, try and learn. The is the way that professionals do it, but we can do it either way. What's Roto's up? Is that okay. like a Isn't that a company that like things under pipes? Roto-Rooter. That's what I'm thinking of. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. What's that? What oh, this thing? It's like, oh, yeah. And it is. I like think I saw one of those somewhere. And, and then, then you see that depth angle? Uh, this is how you control some. depth. So you're not hitting that, uh, on that insulation. What? Never used that. So uh, you got one of those? I don't. No, I don't have that one. I have the. I have an oscillating blade, which. Oh, so this is the same as a rotor. Like rotor. rotor, rotor right now. So you're saying this? What's this? So rotary. Just look at one one video of it. Rotary so... It's, uh, Roto Zip. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meet okay. Kate yeah, Kate. I, I'll be curious An about this. I've been eyeing this for a while, it brings but digital I never got one to because I ended up spinning it only for drywall. I don't think, I don't know that it will work in plywood. The Roto Zip? Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Again. You talking about roto zip? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I've, I've never like seen this thing either. If so. I should. Mm -hmm. You've, You've seen, seen it being used no, other than drywall? I've never seen it. Oh, so okay. That's why I'm kind of surprised right now. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, how would you do it? I, I've so been looking. I, I, I looked at it. Would we do the plan? Mm -hmm. The, the cutout. Can we just fit, fit it, onto the wall and then just cut it with a circular saw for the windows? I think that would work now. Like Godzilla, when you got a model house. Well, it's all going to get trimmed up, so we're sa we're safe. We can go cut up, cut. You you you're like talking about? Oh no. How do we cut out the? Mm. Make, if we talk about interior interior panels, how do we cut out the windows? Right. Like, just me just do it off and just measure and do it off site because I actually think putting it in place. Well, that's what. Right. That's what it's normally done, but I am thinking. I think like a circular saw is is difficult because if people don't stop, they're gonna cut the frame. A circular saw will cut the frame very easily. Um, but uh, Jeff has a small reciprocating saw, a small skill saw mm -hmm. that is not the size of yours. Yours are very powerful too. We need a tool that is like a little powerful, but not enough that will cut right through the frame. Do you mean a jigsaw? To do what you say. No, a um, a skill saw, it, like it, but a small one, like like if I can pull it up, like a dual, a battery operated uh, skill saw. Uh, so like the one I got, or smaller? I don't. I haven't seen the one we you got. Yeah. Saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we have reciprocating saw and and yeah, skill saw. Yeah, I think I think we should give it a try. Yeah. In place, actually, the reciprocating would be. Pretty decent. No, not a skill saw. We have to right. I mean, anyway, we can't do it while it's on, right? How do you see where your cut marks are? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 you're cutting I meant blindly, yeah. yeah. Just take it down. That's skill okay. We'll measure it up. Yeah. Skill size. yeah, we'll probably just measure it up, yeah. And then we'll do mine. That's true. true. Yeah, because, I mean, you don't know yeah. if you're going to be, like, blindly poking in and stuff, yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, yeah. All right. We'll do that. Uh. Mm. Yeah, like I'll have a good solution. And then uh, electrical inspection is no problem. Yeah, so it's it's actually like, 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 like a much smaller blade. They're, they're 16 on center, the, the things are perfectly on the 48s. I mean, there shouldn't be any surprises here. With the windows? Wind uh, the windows, tougher. that's fair. It's but that's all I'm mean, talking about. The, yeah. So, um... The, even the things on the back of the windows are... are but the the circular saw right? won't be good. Uh, I think we could yeah. Do yeah, but we're saying yeah, just take it off and measure it. Circular saw would be good at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like why risk it? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. And um, it's going to be four four walls, right? Yeah, there's two windows here and then two, uh, four windows on the uh, second floor and stuff like that. So if you want, like we can, de so we definitely have a team on the stairs. So we're we're cutting the treads and and cut and measuring there. We can have a team on the the bottom left corner here, in which case we do cut out that electrical outlet box to fit it in uh, on the panel itself. And that panel there, <laughs> if we put them in the uh, right place, oh, oh, has oh, okay, sorry. Can I Can I interrupt? Maybe your guys is what you're saying, but I just saw like mm -hmm. one of the issues um, with chip -like material is that you very easily get the measurements wrong for the holes for the windows. Um, so one possibility, I don't know how practical this would be, would be to ju just push the panel against the window as it is, and then from the outside just trace the contour. There is no outside, there's a window in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, but a window opens, right? No, it's got screen. <coughs> Can we take the screen out? Yeah, we could take the screen out. <laughs> I think that oh, the yeah, are removable, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you can... It, Right. Even if you just mark the beginning and the end point, that usually your hole ends up being off or horizontally because you don't account for the shape. Part of it. That's the problem. Take out the screen. You can do half of it. So you can at least you can at least like this much space for the rest. Yeah, yeah. You can you can get two points and then those two points. So do people you know, mark from the outside by opening up the window? Say so that again. Do people mark from the outside by opening a window? No, they measure, but it's like you have to know the material really well, and you have to have like your math yeah, really sure, right, yeah. and you need to know your spots. It, it's a, it's a, it's a skill yeah. process to to mark the, to even just the marking carefully. of the hole. Oh, yeah. Get up there. Yeah. yeah. This is way easier than we're making it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, it'd be better if we saw it up there, 
everything's kind of in the abstract right okay. now. It's hard to. Let's move to the side. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Roll allocations. <laughs> roll allocations. Who's working the the stairway? I can work stairways a bit. I mean, we yeah, started it. We yeah, we need it. to finish this. Like, I think it's uh, finish the stairs. Mm -hmm. uh, but so basically, you swarm on the stairs. But anyone who's free, go to the first panel there. Mm -hmm. And when we, are we, we need start to. The wiring? Uh, the wiring we can. Once I've seen wiring. I mean, we have to do the whole what house what about before. Uh, the wire that's already there. Well, you you need you need the the, the bigger wire to connect. To one of them. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Right, so right. But I mean, that y you pretty much do all at once because you don't want to do it like uh -huh. one here, one there. Just I mean, yeah. that would be really after all the so panels we are up. The wall, so the interior walls and the stairs, and then we start with the wiring. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be key. You we'll have to drill the drill bit for the holes in the wall to run line. Uh, what line? Well, the electrical line. We have to have the ship left. We don't need to do. Yeah. Oh, for what? We don't need to drill for any studs. We just need the box. Box tape, so that would be jig, jigsaw. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this is going to go down, but I know we're going to need it for at least a couple of them. What, what do you jigsaw? To run the line through the the two buys. Um, under but some yeah, but we're not getting to the running the lines yet. All the lines that all those outlets are already actually in the walls, so they got little stubs of wires coming out of them. So at the end of the day, we run the long wires from the electrical box. To the through the channel, but there's no no drilling at all there. Mm -hmm. It's just in front of the walls. The so what are you putting on the channel when you uh, close it up? It's the same same exterior material. You're gonna have wires interior. on the outside of your, no, your no, two no. buys. No, I mean yes, outside the two buys, but it's just they're all covered up. It's in the document. So you're pinching you're pinching an electrical line against the. No. It's not pinched. There's a spacer there. There's three three quarter inch space. So. It's like slide 61. Yeah, there. there. So the panel is here. There's a space in front of it, in front of all the studs, and then you got the spacers, which are three one bys, which are three quarter by 1.5 inch. So you got three quarter space. You can put in a bunch of wires there. That's kind of accurate, and you can fit like that many wires in there. Seven inches. Seven inch tall, so you got plenty of room. This, not a problem. When it comes to, our, maybe I'm just because you got to you, you got to just stagger them. Yeah, they can't be like all bunched up one on top of the other because you can only do like two or three in a three quarter inch, probably like two in a three quarter inch space. But you know, you get two layers of wires, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah. You, you we'll you need. Can, you can still use the um, the plastic nail spacers every because as you oh yeah. move from module oh to yeah module, yeah. you can tack them in place so they're not just right, right. together. Yeah, they're not gonna be clumped. Have you ever seen that? Done? What do you mean? Yeah. So you what though? Seen channel done? No, we innovate no. on everything. No, okay. but I mean, I've, I've routed electric wires and I've had to route them along like a rim joist and it's just dizzy as hell because it's coming out of the bridge box. So you just run a strand and you tack it in place and then you run a strand below it, tack it in place. You keep them all separate and nice and tight. But there's a lot of Z height there and you can probably run five. The height isn't the issue. But they don't stick up that far. They don't okay. I mean, those are what, three quarter inch? Standoff or yeah, I mean it's wired. Like I mean, it's the height is regular the wires. It's the way to get modular to modular. Yeah. It's open. It's on the face of the module. But you're making all your connections like within the depth. Of the wall module. You're bringing your wire. Yeah. 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 Yeah.